I'm going to take you through to cocktails. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So as a child, I was inspired to become an adventurer scientist, to go where no one else would ever go and see what no one else would ever see. All this despite the fact that none of the faces that represented expeditions, exploration, adventure looked anything like me. Now you'd think, coming from a beautiful tropical island in the heart of the northern Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka, becoming a marine biologist would be a natural choice. But it wasn't the case. In Sri Lanka, we didn't have marine scientists, so when I told people, I'm going to study marine biology, they said, ooh, there's no scope for that in this country. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. Many who knew I had to go abroad to study assumed I would never return home. But Sri Lanka was always at my core. I, know I, would, I knew I'd go back because I needed to serve. And then in 2003, something incredible happened. I was working on a whale research vessel that was circumnavigating the globe. To be clear, I was working on the Sri Lanka leg only. But that's not the point. Um, I managed to wangle my way on, and on this expedition, we were tracking sperm whales by eavesdropping on their conversations. And when we caught up with them, we'd take these tiny biopsy samples that could tell us about the toxicology of the ocean environment. At the same time, we always had someone up on watch looking out for signs of life. So on this particular day of significance, I was that person up on watch. I was determined to find this pod of sperm whales that we'd been tracking through the night. I could hear that cacophonous chatter emanating from the pilot house below. I knew they were close. And I knew what I was looking for, this short, lofty blow slanted off onto the left-hand side, super characteristic of a sperm whale. But I looked and I stared and I was getting so frustrated. I was coming to the end of my shift, I was just about to wrap up, and then I took one glance across the horizon, and that's when I saw this. A tall, powerful, vertical blow that rose all the way to the sky as far as I could tell. I immediately knew it had to come from an animal that was incredibly large. So I grabbed my walkie-talkie and I called down to my captain. I said, Bob, Bob, 11 o'clock, two kilometers, go. And very calmly he says, why? So I say, I think it's a blue whale. And he says, fine. So he turns the vessel in this direction that I'm now suggested, and we're moving, and I'm starting to panic because I'm thinking, gosh, I can't afford to lose sight of this. So I'm staring in this direction, tears streaming down my cheeks, panicking, trying not to lose sight, and that's when I start to think I'm losing my mind. Because it's not six blue, it's not one blue whale I'm seeing, but it's six blue whales in an area the size of a soccer pitch. So immediately I'm thinking, why would this animal, the largest to ever roam the planet, that can go 70% of the planet, choose to aggregate in this tiny part of a tropical Indian Ocean? The good news was that I was fresh out of undergrad, so I had all the answers. I reflected back, and I thought about what my textbooks and professors had said, and they said, Large whales, like blue whales, undertake long-range migrations between cold feeding areas and warm breeding and calving areas. That was it. I was super stoked. I was going to be the first person to ever document blue whales mating. So obviously, I'm on the edge of my seat telling Bob, let's go, we have to go faster, come on, let's go, 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 go. We're getting closer and closer and closer. And it's not at all what you expect to see. There's no hanky-panky. They're just hanging out at the surface, lolling, as one does. And so now I turn to Bob, and I'm like, so do you think we can hang around for a little bit? And he says, sure. And that's when we saw this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a pile of blue whale poop. Not only is it a stunning red color, but the exciting part is that seeing poop was an indicator that these animals are feeding somewhere close. But remember what I told you. Blue whales go to cold waters to feed and warm waters to breed and calve. 
Sri Lanka is five degrees above the equator. It's as warm and as tropical as you can get. So these animals had figured out how to feed here. This was my eureka moment. Not everyone can say that their career started with a pile of poop, but mine did, and I'm really pleased about that. So all of you in the audience will probably think, that's an auspicious start to a career for an aspiring scientist and explorer. But that wasn't the case for me. In my excitement, I wrote off to scientists across the world in the global north, and I said, hey, can you give me some advice, some guidance? I want to launch a project. And I got a flurry of responses. But in a nutshell, they said, get us a research permit so we can bring our teams to do the work. That was my first experience with parachute science. Parachute science, colonial science, conservation, exploration is where people from the global north come to countries like mine, the global south, developing world, do work and leave with no investment in the local capacity, infrastructure, and no inclusivity. The work creates a dependency on external expertise. It's not sustainable in the long term very often cripples long-term efforts that have been going on on the ground for a long time. It can be driven by the outsider's assumptions, motives, and needs, and creates an unequal power imbalance. I soon recognized that I was being judged on where I came from, but not what I could do. So I politely refused any offer of help. For the next five years, struggled to kickstart the Sri Lankan Blue Well project. Today, this project has been pivotal in us understanding the role of tropical marine ecosystems in the lives of the largest animal that has ever roamed the planet. So since then, I've done a lot of things. I have a beautiful career where I've worked with sperm whale culture, I work on the front lines of marine disasters, pioneered deep sea research in Sri Lanka, uh, worked with illegal fisheries. But as we talk about what's next for exploration, I ask you to all stop and listen to my human story. I come from the global south, so the opportunities I've had and continue to have pale in comparison to my counterparts in the global north. While the biases I face and continue to face are many times more. I've had to work so much harder to be where I am today. I'm not going to let it go to waste. But I can tell you, it is tiring. It is tiring that people continue to tell us that we don't care because of where we come from, but then yet we're expected to fight for our oceans and at the same time fight for our rightful seat at the table. The harsh reality is for too long, the stories, experiences, and voices of people like myself from the Global South or from local and indigenous communities have been overlooked, suppressed, undermined. But if you think about the ocean, 70% of our coastlines are in the developing world. Where is the representation at the global stage? I want to remind you that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. So that lack of representation has nothing to do with our lack of capacity, but everything to do with a broken system that is heavily biased. So as we celebrate the power of exploration, I ask you all to ask these questions. Who are we celebrating? What are the stories we are uplifting? And when we think about these stories, I want us to learn to not dehumanize them. Don't take the human story out, away from the achievements. Because when we do that and we take that away, it's very easy for us to get very starry-eyed and celebrate the wrong people. People who have a fleeting moment and do this amazing thing and leave, but not those people on the ground who've been working for decades for those species, habitats, and communities that their lives are dedicated to. We can do much better. We can build equitable partnerships that celebrate everybody. So my greatest learning on this journey has been that as someone from, from an underrepresented group who has made it into these spaces. It's not enough for me to celebrate my own achievements and the achievements of my dreams. 
If I am not then using that hard-earned, newfound privilege to create spaces for others like me. That is incredibly important because I know history has shown me that if I'm not doing that, no one else will. So through my organization, Ocean Swell, back in Sri Lanka, I work to nurture the next generation of diverse ocean heroes. I want to create spaces so others can swoop in and take over because I want to write myself out of projects and I want to retire young. But I also dream of the day that people from my coastlines will have the freedom to tra travel through the world like most of you do. I dream of the day that these people, their explorations, their achievements will be celebrated and their names won't be erased from history. I dream of the day that the people in my parts of the world will be recognized for all the incredible work that we've been doing on the ground for generations and the support that we've provided to projects across the world. We talk about capacity building as this unidirectional flow. We are the recipients. It's not true. Uh, capacity is built two ways. And when we can be mutually respectful of each other, that's when we'll see that change. So today I ask you all to remember me as the marine scientist who fought to decolonize science, conservation, exploration, and storytelling, to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion, and create opportunities for those who have been denied them too long. Because I truly believe if we really want to save our oceans, every coastline needs a local hero. Thank you.